Hello and welcome to Facebook Live and College Talk Tuesday. This is Andy Lockwood and I am normally joined by my wife and business partner, Pearl, but she is off uh, driving the kids off to hang out with their family. So instead, I have a special guest host, this guy from Syracuse University who neither endorses nor has anything to do with this production, uh, The Pillow Pet. So... Pearl's a lot more skinny than this, so this is don't don't take this the wrong way. Um, so the purpose of College Talk Tuesday is to talk about college stuff, including financial aid admissions, how to get in, how to uh, multiply your chances, I should say, of getting in, how to pick a college that helps you get a great return on investment for a college, meaning not so much about the four years of college, but the 40 years after college, how to eliminate crushing debt, which is something that I went through with my own college and law school experience. Uh, today, what we're doing is some Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can post them right here on this page. I will um, write in the comments section. And please like, comment, and share uh, this, this episode so that you can help spread the word and other people can get their college questions asked also. So I have a, an intern here who's gonna help me with the questions today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. How annoying would it be if I did the whole broadcast like that? Pretty annoying. All right. I went with orange colored um, mascots today. Okay, so I have uh, five questions, actually six questions, because uh, I just came up with one on the fly based on a conversation I had with a prospective client minutes ago, earlier today. And that question had to do with, I guess I'll give you the, the fact pattern. Uh, he and his wife earn mid six figures, uh, close to $300,000 a year, and their kids are a little younger, just entering high school. I'm changing some of these facts just uh, so I can be a little bit more confidential, I guess. And he's saved uh, a decent amount of money, six figures, into 529 plans for each of his three kids. And his question to me was, I don't think there's any way possible we're going to get need-based financial aid. Is there any reason that I should stop putting money into my 529? So the 529 is a college savings plan that uh, is a device uh, that was you know, part of the Higher Education Act that it gives you sort of incentive to save for college. The issue with the 529, though, is that it counts against you in the financial aid formula, meaning that it reduces your, your ability to qualify for a need-based aid. It's not a question of whether it counts. It's how much it counts. Most schools penalize it at around 5% of the amount, meaning that your, your eligibility is reduced by 5% of the, you know, the body of the, the principal amount. Um, I suspect, it's not just me, but I, I suspect that many colleges also will, um, will penalize you more than that 5%. It could be triple or quadruple that amount. It, re it really depends. So, um, so the question is, well, okay, maybe I'm not gonna qualify for need-based aid because my income is too high, does this have any bearing on any other type of money that I might, might, I might be able to get or my kids might be able to get? And what I said to him was, well, you know, in theory, whether you qualify for need-based aid and merit-based aid are two entirely separate things. In practice, I feel like those two things are blurred very frequently. So what I'm getting at is there are some colleges, many colleges, that require you to fill out your financial aid forms even if you are not going to be a candidate for need-based aid. So need-based aid is based on your income, your savings, uh, number of children you have in college at the same time, your age, and 70-something other factors. The term merit-based aid just means anything that's not need-based. So merit could mean great grades, it could mean uh, athletic you know, scholarships, it could mean music, it could mean community service type of scholarships, it, it's, it's whatever the college decides. So. What I was saying to, to, to uh, this gentleman was that in, in practice, I find that there, there is potentially some blurring. So take, for example, Fordham University. Um, I don't have their mascot here, the Rams, but we can talk about them anyway. Fordham is one of those schools that requires people to fill out the uh, financial aid forms, the, the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and the CSS Profile, in order to be considered for merit-based money. So my, you know, my, my argument to, which, I, which by the way, I wasn't saying this very strongly to, to this gentleman, but I said you know, the argument that you should be aware of is that, um, well, why, you know, if, if in fact they are asking you for your financial information, your, meaning to disclose your relative strength 
in, in your ability to pay for college, then is, are they going to take that into consideration somehow for your uh, merit-based eligibility? And you know, my feeling is, well, why else would they be asking for that? But I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not one to say that's very clear cut. I just think you need to be aware. At the end of the day, I told them, I don't think you're a, a good client for us at this point. I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I don't think that you need to start, you know, moving money around and, and things like that. Um, that that being said, if anyone, anyone here uh, who is interested in talking to us one on one about their college plan, even if you don't have one, I'm going to post that link after I get off the air right now. So let me move on to the, the second. So so in other words, just to wrap up, I did not think for him there was any need to move money around because I don't think there is a clear bearing on need based and merit based when it comes to your savings. So in other words. And there are other people who disagree with me, so I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm a. I'm a huge uh, proponent of, or, or I'm very doctrinaire about this. But in other words, I don't think if you're gonna only if you're only going for merit-based money, I don't think you should be moving your own assets around in order to make yourself look worse on paper, meaning have fewer resources, um, just for the sole purpose of, uh, of, of of qualifying for merit-based money. Some people do that. Some people don't. I'm not a financial advisor, so I don't make you know commissions for suggesting that people move money around, things like that. Maybe that has something to do to do with some of the advice. Uh, decide for yourself. Okay, that was question number one. Now, the next question is how important is it to visit colleges? So I, I get this question kind of frequently, and the answer is that it is very important because it demonstrates that you are interested in seeing a college. Plus, of course, it gives you the, a, a good feel for the school, but honestly, sooner or later, the, those types of visits blend into each other, and I, I prefer to do college visits strategically. That being said, it's impossible for, to see every college that you're applying to. It's just you know, because of time, because of distance, because of money, you name it. So um, you, you should, my rule of thumb is definitely see you know, the top 70% of the schools that you are very interested in. And um, th the term demonstrating interest to them means that you show up on campus, you register, and they, a lot of schools, not every school, but a lot of schools keep track of that. And what they're trying to do is to um, uh, get to know how interested you are in them so that they don't offer you admission for you to say, oh, you know, thanks, uh, but no thanks, we're not coming. That affects something called the yield. The yield is the ratio of the people who are admitted compared to the people who uh, matriculate. And the better that percentage, the better the school's rank and so forth, better, you know, there's more, more benefits to the school, the worse that is, uh, then it makes the school look comparatively worse. So they don't want to waste a slot on someone who is not going to show up. Every year I see examples of kids who should have, quote unquote, gotten into a college, but they don't. Usually it comes down to not demonstrating interest, not always, but, but frequently I should say. That's the one thing that's in your control is demonstrating interest. So I think it's important not only to get to know a college um, to visit it, but also to demonstrate interest. The rest of the story is I think that if you have an idea of what you might major in or other types of um, you know, uh, areas that you're interested in, I think you'd be much more well served to spend time with those department heads and professors and, and, and upperclassmen and, talk, and ask them a series of questions that will you know, kind of give you a feel for the quality of education and the support after you know, uh, helping you get to, to life after college, career center. These are all places that I think you should, uh, you should you know, go maybe not in lieu of the college tour, but certainly uh, in addition to the standard college tour and info session, which are basically sales pitches. All right, question number three. How are we doing on time? Good. All right, question number three, uh, is the 529 bad? Mm -hmm. Oh, I skipped a question. That's, that's question number three. Uh, but I added a bonus question. So I skipped the second one. I'm divorced. This is from Cindy. I'm divorced, and what happens if my ex-husband will not contribute to college? So um, for financial aid purposes, most colleges only care about the custodial parent, meaning the parent that the child resides with a majority of time. So that's different then on a tax return. A tax return, one parent declares a kid as a dependent. So that is not necessarily the same thing for financial aid purposes. It's Department of Treasury rules versus uh, Department of Education rules. So there are, I don't know, maybe 100 colleges or so in the country, if I had to guess, 
that not only want the custodial parents' information, but also the non-custodial parents' information. There's a form called the non-custodial parent profile. You need to figure out ahead of time what forms your colleges uh, on your list require. And most of them are going to be the FAFSA only, meaning the free application for federal student aid. Uh, a relatively smaller amount, 260 or so colleges in the country, out of the 4,000 in the country, require a CSS profile, which is much longer, much more convoluted, and much more time-consuming and confusing than the FAFSA. And then there's the non-custodial parent profile, which is uh, maybe a third of the CSS profile schools. That they, they require those in addition. So if you're um, X will not, it's always a deadbeat dad, unfortunately, I was going to say your ex, but if, if the dad will not participate, will not fill stuff out on the profile, you're going to have to tell, explain that to your college financial aid office and say to them, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do this. Most colleges will understand and they'll say, okay, just sign this, you know, affidavit or something saying that, uh, you know, you can't get anywhere and you can't get this information. But there are a handful of colleges that will play hardball with you and say, either get him to fill this out or we're not going to consider your application. So it's going to vary by school. Um, and, and then the other thing is, I guess related to this, is um, there's a difference between how much someone has the ability to contribute and what they've agreed to contribute. So you may have a, a divorce or settlement agreement with your ex, which... Um, is uh, might might stipulate that he supposed or she, you know, he's supposed to contribute up to, you know, eighty percent of a state college, the prevailing rates at a at a state's co college wherever you uh, wherever you live, but if he makes you know six hundred thousand dollars, his resources, his ability to pay, are um, you know are significantly more than what his legal obligation is, and the non custodial parent profile looks at the latter, his ability to pay, not the former, not what he's legally obligated to pay. So that's my wrap on divorce. Now I'm getting to Stephen's question, which is, is the 529 bad? And um, the answer is that I don't think it's bad or good. It's, it's, it does count against you. I said that before. But for many families, it doesn't matter because their income is too high. It knocks them out of the box for need-based aid. So um, what, I, what I say is it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's a depends answer, meaning that if you can qualify for need-based financially because your income is at such a level where uh, where it, it allows that, and you have 529s, then it might be bad, then you might be in a situation where it would pay to examine whether or not to shift your funds around, to move them from a place where it counts against you to a place that counts against you less or maybe doesn't count against you at all. Are there magic numbers or magic rules for determining eligibility for financial aid? No, there is no income ceiling there's no magic number that if you go over it, you're not going to qualify, but I can give you some rules of thumb right here, which uh, I, I get asked to, uh, to do that a lot. So um, the first rule of thumb is um, if you are applying to a private college and your income, all income, taxable and non-taxable, is uh, $200,000, the closer you get to $200,000 in income, the harder it is to qualify. That being said, if you have two kids in college at the same time, you will be able to qualify at private colleges with income in the mid to upper $200,000 because the financial aid formula takes a percentage of your income, takes a percentage of your assets, takes a percentage of your child assets, and so forth. So right now I'm just talking about one sliver, of the, but it's the most important part of the financial aid formula. So there's no, you'll never be able to find any published you know, maximum or ceiling or whatever on any college's website or uh, anywhere because it doesn't exist. It's, it's formulaic. But, um, if you're applying to state colleges, the income needs to be a lot lower. In general, $60,000, $70,000 and up, it's very hard to qualify from a, uh, from a, for federal aid from a state college, state university, you know, either in the state where you reside or outside of the state that you reside. Those are just rules of thumb. So. Um, so the 529 again, get, getting back to that, if you are, uh, if your if your income is within those, you know those uh, you know, those limits, then the, having a 529 is not necessarily a good thing. And then what you should consider is, okay, are there penalties for withdrawing my 529? And almost certainly there are. How much are those penalties? Meaning, do the calculation. 
most penalty, I, I believe most penalties are, are 10% of the earnings on the 529 if it's not used for quote unquote qualified higher education expenses. Qualified higher education expense is a, is a term of art that's very narrowly defined to mean tuition and room and board and not a lot else in the calendar year um, that you're in college. It, it does not include loan repayment uh, unless it's in that calendar, in that 12 month uh, uh, calendar year. So, um, I'm sorry, 12 month, not calendar, but loan repayment, can, you can use, in other words, if you borrowed money in, uh, in March, you would have up until the following end of February to be able to use a 529 to repay what you borrowed. That, that's just the way it is. I don't know anyone who does that, but I, I remember reading that. So um, 529 may be bad, may be good, may be friend, may be foe. It really depends on not only your income, but also the types of colleges that you're applying to, whether they are FAFSA schools or FAFSA plus CSS profile schools. Okay, how we doing? Still funny, sorry. Um, this one's from Michelle. My, my daughter has no idea what she wants to major in. What should I do? Yeah, well, that is, uh, that's normal. And even, by the way, 80% of kids switch majors. So even the kids who are dead certain that they know what they want to do with the rest of their lives, the odds are against them actually sticking to that uh, declaration. So I, the, the way I, I uh, I'll tell you our process, and uh, I mentioned this a lot, and we did this with uh, my own son about three, four weeks ago. And it was actually a big sigh of relief for me and Pearl. Right, honey? No, still not Pearl. Still funny, though. And um, uh, we've done this process with roughly 140, 140 uh, 150 kids. And before we started doing this with our in our own practice, Pearl and I did this ourselves. We did a combination of a strength assessment, meaning to figure out how we're wired. And then from there, what, and this is what we do with, with clients, we then say, okay, here are a bunch of fields that you should consider that you can also actually make a living in, as opposed to you know, jobs that have no growth, no upside potential, at least according to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and you know, perhaps uh, some, 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 other types of, uh, some other types of data. That's where we start, not to pick one thing, but maybe three or four or five, hopefully overlapping things, again, based on how a kid is wired, and then backward plan into majors and, and, and potential careers, and then backward plan again into a college list. So you might be thinking, well, how, you know, like, like uh, Michelle, how can, um, you know, my 16-year-old kid have any idea what they want to do? The point is, is that even if they think they do, they don't know the right questions to ask 99% of the time. So part of those questions are, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are my aptitudes, which are not always um, known? Um, I had another call this morning with a client who uh, told me that this assessment was spot on and it confirmed a lot of the things that they had uh, kind of intuitively understood about their son who is a computer engineering and software engineering type of kid. And that came up very highly as, uh, in terms of correlating between what jobs were available that, where he could make a living and how he was wired. So uh, sometimes this talks people out of things. Uh, you know, I had a client who the parents assumed was going into the family business, which is owning a pharmacy, and then uh, this assessment revealed that that would be terrible. And by the way, she had no interest in doing this, but she didn't understand why. But she was not great at taking tests. She was not a, you know, great in the sciences and a few other sort of obvious clues. And the parents, you know, they, we were on the call and they, they sort of said to themselves, yeah, I know, but can't she just at least try it? And at the end of the day, that would have been a terrible move for her to go to pharmacy school. She could have been frustrated for 40 years, you know, potentially. Uh, I, I, or she could have just, you know, transferred and maybe transferred again. Who, who knows? The, the, you know, the issue today is that it takes so long to get out of college. Uh, anywhere from 33 to 39% of kids get out in four years. Only 33 to 39%, depending on the study. So most people are taking an extra year or two to get out. So that extra year costs you tuition. You know, who knows? It's anywhere from 25, I guess, to 60 something thousand dollars, plus the opportunity cost of not working in that extra year you're stuck in school. So right there, you're looking at, you know, potentially a, a hundred to 150 thousand dollar problem for one year. To me, just going into school, like, ah, oh, you'll figure it out, like we could all do when we were growing up, you know, winging it. In other words, that's not a responsible option. So, uh, so we, so that's why. 
finally, after you know, kind of searching for this type of answer on and off three years ago, we brought in a career counselor who's fantastic and she's able to kind of walk kids through this strength finding assessment as well as uh, draw on her other experiences as a former admissions officer at a state, a big state school in the, in the Northeast and the high school guidance counselor and help kids on, uh, you know, get on the right path toward not coming down to one career major, but maybe three or four overlapping ones out of seven or eight or nine that are that are um, suggested. Okay, so that was kind of long-winded, but I, I, I definitely go off on a tangent on that too. And the last question here, do we have time? We've got a little bit more time here. Do you have any tips on the college essay? My daughter has no idea where to start. So we, we did a, um, uh, a, a webinar uh, on the college essay, and I will post the link to that webinar. Uh, it's, uh, but it's collegesuccess4less.com. That's, not, that's the number four, collegesuccess4less.com. And, uh, yeah, the problem with the essay is that you, you have five choices that are basically cliche type of uh, questions, and the assignment is to write something that's not cliche. Also, it's unusual you know, for kids who have written about themselves this way in a conversational way uh, at any time in, in school because most English you know, uh, curriculums don't promote this type of writing. So that's also why it's hard. So my answer there is, um, you know, I, I can't tell you where to start without you, you know, going through the questions with us, but you're not alone. And if, uh, that is another service that we offer. So anyone who's interested in that can, can certainly talk to us um, about that too, as long as we still have room for a class of 2017 kids. It's in the middle of August. We're getting very tight, starting to have to juggle some things. So... Uh, uh, I will you know, do my best to find room for you if you reach out to us sooner rather than later. I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this, though. All right, I think that um, that's going to wrap it up for today's edition of College Talk Tuesday. Please like, comment, and share. That would really help me. It would help the Syracuse guy. It would help the Florida guy. Um, it would help Pearl come back and, and join me here. I don't like doing these alone. That's why I surrounded myself with stuffed animals. Uh, I hope that you... Um, I hope that you find this valuable, and please uh, spread it around. This is Andy Lockwood, College Talk Tuesday, and I'm signing off. Bye-bye.